heartbreaking account of a young man's death from a pack of wild wolves in a frozen Canadian forest, which you are about to hear, is based on a real event. It concerns a young college student who was stalked in the woods by the animals and ultimately killed by them. This is the terrifying attack on Kent and Joel Carnegie that was carried out by the wolf. But what happened and why did the wolves attack? This and other questions will be answered in the video. Welcome to Wild Assault. An 8 November 2005. Kenton Joel Carnegie, a 22-year-old student of geological engineering, was nearing the end of his semester at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada, an internship at the Point North Uranium Mining Company in the northeastern Saskatchewan province had been offered to him, and he was thrilled to have the chance to work for such a prestigious organization. However, the uranium mine was practically in the middle of nowhere and over 900 miles or 1,500 kilometers away from his college when he began his career. The closest city was more than two hours away and hundreds of miles of wilderness and wildlife surrounded it. The region had a variety of geographical features, including lakes, rivers, dense forests, and in the winter, snowy plains. The apex predator of this frozen wilderness was a species of gray wolf known as the timber wolf, along with other animals like the lynx, moose, and black bear. For the duration of his internship, Kenton settled down in one of the camps close to the other miners after arriving at the facility. He loved the outdoors and occasionally yearned to travel further into the woods to explore and enjoy some solitude far from the camp settlement. He was given permission by his superiors to take a walk around the plant's perimeter for a few days, but he was cautioned against going too far into the woods. And on November 8th at 5.30 p. M. Kenton left the facility after being given permission to take a stroll around the neighborhood. He informed one of his fellow campers that he would return by 7 p.m., just in time for dinner. It was getting dark, and the sun was setting. Before returning to the camp, Kenton made the decision to hike a half mile to a nearby lake to watch the sunset next to the shore. He stayed there for a while, and only left to go back home while it was still light outside. Looking ahead at the dense forest and the accumulating snow that made walking difficult, Kenton started moving in the direction of the camp. He found it difficult to walk and had to lengthen his strides to compensate for his sluggish gait. He came to a startling realization around this time. He thought he could hear something following him. From among the tall, frozen trees, he sensed someone watching him. Looking behind him, Kenton spotted a lone wolf. He stood a few yards away and gave it a quick glance trying to determine what it was up to. He turned his head back forward, hoping that the wolf would leave because it did not appear to be a threat at this time. Kenton became aware of the presence of another wolf in front of him. His heartbeat quickened, and he was no longer as calm as he had been before he realized the sky was growing darker by the minute. He now felt trapped. He had been surrounded by the wolves in a cynical and planned manner. Later, Footsteps revealed that Kenton had been being followed ever since he had left the camp. Now that time was of the essence, panic began to set in. Kenton Joel acted contrary to what he ought to have done given the circumstances. He began to run. The two wolves were encouraged to begin following him by his quickened pace. Kenton became aware that he was engaged in a pursuit by a forest predator and stopped being as trusting of its motives. Still one kilometer from safety, Kenton screamed in terror as two more wolves joined the pack and followed him. He was unable to outrun the predators who were fighting on their own territory and outnumbering him due to the adrenaline, fear, and the deep snow under his feet. When Wolf finally caught him, he bit him on the side of the torso to draw the first blood. Blood stains were visible on the white snow behind Kenton as he fled bleeding. He was now fighting for his life after no one responded to his cries for assistance. In an effort to foil his attempt to flee, the wolves closed in on him and bit him again on the thigh. Finally, he sank to his knees while still attempting to escape danger by crawling. In his dying moments, 
One of the wolves leapt at Kenton as the pack began to circle him in a deranged manner. The entire pack jumped on him all at once in the excitement of a successful hunt, and he began to punch and fight it off. Kenton's future was practically decided. One of the wolves bit into his thigh with its razor-sharp teeth. His right hand was bit by the other, having briefly escaped their grasp. Kenton was able to take a few steps forward in an effort to reach safety, as evidenced by the footsteps that were later found. But he was soon apprehended once more. His limbs had grown numb with fear, and he was now gasping for air. The wolves did not spare him this time. In the end, he stopped moving and passed away back at the plant after chunks of flesh from all over his body were bit out. At 7.30, his campmates awaited his return. After waiting for him to return for a half hour, they were now worried for his safety. In their pickup truck, a group of workers made the decision to search for Kenton in the forest. They knew there had been wolves in the area before when they noticed paw prints following Kenton's footprints in the snow. Concern over a potential wolf attack has now emerged. They returned to the factory to get a rifle so they could continue looking for Kenton. They noticed a dark spot in the white snow path ahead, not far from the plant grounds. They moved closer to it to get a better look since it was now nighttime. They came to the conclusion that it was a heap of bloody clothing containing a crumpled and dismembered human body. What had happened was now obvious. The plant workers climbed back into the truck, picked up a pile of bones and flesh, and loaded it. Two pairs of glowing eyes were reportedly seen in the distance behind some trees, according to one of the truckers. As they were returning home, they could also hear wolf howls in the distance. Investigations conducted after the attack confirmed suspicions that the attack had been carried out by forest wolves, showing that the wolves had come dangerously close to the plant's premises due to the improper food disposal method used there. Food wrappers, leftovers, and food scraps had been placed in metal containers outside the building, attracting the attention of wolves that were nearby and looking for food. Due to the increase in encounters, they no longer feared people and now view them as potential prey. The incident necessitated a number of modifications to the plant's waste food processing procedures. However, the area was deemed safe for operations within the plant's constrained grounds. A drive to call the dangerous wolves was started after an electric fence was put in place and their population was driven back, miles away from the location of the plant. When Kenton Joel's parents learned of his brutal death, they were inconsolable because there was little of their beloved son's body that could be returned to them. Together with the University of Waterloo administration, Clinton's family established a memorial scholarship in his honor and wished that no parent would ever again have to witness such a heartbreaking tragedy. An innocent person is taken by a vicious pack of man-eating wolves to meet their demise.